God, I felt good. As promised, as soon as we were able to get the cash, which necessitated a ride from Officer Lively, who was only too happy to drive us on our errands, mainly because it afforded him the opportunity to play Habitat Docent. We found a Motel 6, grabbed some takeout, procured a couple bottles of scotch, and holed up in the room with the air conditioner chugging away at full blast. Actually, I was holed up, lying on the bed wearing only a towel and the kind of gratitude toward the universe that only comes into play when you've had all that you can take for one day and your aching muscles are cramping little reminders that rest is not only possible, it's a gift that shouldn't be taken for granted. Carla wouldn't think of showering until she had something clean to change into, so she left me to perform your little liquid attitude adjustment, as she called it, and set out to find us some clothes. When she finally blustered back into the room, her arms were laden with plastic bags, and her mood was as ripe as I assumed she still smelled. She set a clinking bag down on the edge of my bed without a word, put another on the dresser, and took the third into the bathroom with her. I'd finished about two-thirds of a bottle by the time she came out, hair wet, dressed in a Minnie Mouse t-shirt and a pair of unflattering pants that ended mid-calf. A pair of polka dot flip-flops rounded out the ensemble. Don't say a word. I opened one eye and turned my head to look at her. Oh, how cute. You look like a colorblind tourist. Shut up. You won't think it's so cute when we're hopping the government plan Arecchio's arranged for us tomorrow in matching shirts. I reached into the bag and pulled out the clothing she'd acquired for me. The contents of this bag suggest you didn't peruse all of their offering, Carla. It was a Dollar General, Morno, not a goddamn J.C. Penney's. There wasn't much to choose from in your size. Her shirt was pink. Mine was blue with a giant smiling Mickey Mouse face. The shorts she'd chosen for me were a camouflage design with a string tie at the waist. The bag also contained a three-pack of tidy whities Carla flopped down on the other twin bed and assumed the same position as me, lying on her back, staring at the ceiling. What's this about a plane? I tossed a bag on the floor between our beds. The lady at the desk let me use her computer. I pulled up my work email account and had Mug send me Arecchio's phone number. He got it from your phone, which was in my car, along with my purse and phone. The car is still there. They just dumped everything inside when they grabbed us. So when he saw the car there that night when we got swiped, Muggs brought it home with him. Our friend Muggs seems to have everything under control. I wonder, though, how you got his email. I looked over at her. She was rubbing her face with both hands. I already had his email, Morneau. We chat occasionally. While this appeared to be an insignificant bit of information to her, it wasn't to me. Really? That's fascinating. I'd be interested in knowing what the two of you have to discuss, because I've never found mugs to be all that chatty. I don't want to do this right now, Morno. I'm tired. Carla sat up, yanked the covers back, and climbed beneath him, pulling the comforter over her head. I noticed she hadn't bothered to remove her shoes. I sat up, grabbed the bottle from the bedside table, and took a long swig. Okay. Then I set the bottle down, and in one fluid motion, yanked the covers off her. Or you could tell me what the hell is going on, and then have a nap. Choice is yours. She glared at me through the mass of wet hair partially covering her face. I choose option, leave me the fuck alone. She pulled the covers back over her head. See, the thing is, I wasn't all that tired, all of a sudden. I got the distinct impression there was an entire part of this Lorenzo Rio story I wasn't yet privy to, and that kind of pissed me off. On second thought, I don't think that option is going to work for me, Carla. I ripped the covers back off. 
She sat bolt upright and dragged her fingers through a head of hair that was drying in clumps and fits of tangle from all the on-again, off-again covers business. Fine. Abridged version is this. I had a duffel bag full of cash and didn't know what to do with it, so I started spreading it around here and there. Ha! You're the secret Santa. I pointed at her accusingly. She nodded. I managed to get rid of about 900,000. Criminy woman! You're wandering around Detroit giving out wads of cash to animal shelters and God knows who else, and you didn't think... You want to hear the rest of this story? Because this is your last chance. Open your mouth one more time and I'm locking myself in the bathroom. I'll sleep in the damn tub. Don't think I won't. My answer came in the form of me chugging what was left in the bottle and then tossing it into the trash before motioning for her to continue. I couldn't keep the money at my house, not after it was clear that Lorenzo knew where I lived. That became painfully obvious after you killed the guy in my kitchen. So, I asked Muggs to hold on to it for me. Something about this didn't sit right. I was backtracking in my head, trying to figure out what I was supposed to be asking. But I hadn't come up with anything by the time she started talking again. He was fine with it. He still is. We made an arrangement. Okay, so he wasn't exactly fine with it in the beginning, particularly the part about me not telling you everything, but... I stood up. Okay. Now I'm going to have to interrupt you. Are you telling me that Muggs knew about the money and where it came from this entire time? Carla looked like she wasn't happy about answering the question, but she did anyway. Muggs knows everything. I'm not exactly sure what a stroke feels like, but there was a good chance I was having one. Everything? Everything. Carla's response was a little less in your face this time. I see. And when exactly did you tell him this everything? After I quit working for you. He's the one who talked me into coming back to work, so you should thank him. Her voice rose an octave on that last bit, the way a little girl's does when she's trying to get you on board with the idea of a sleepover. Oh, don't you worry about that. My first stop when we get home will be the meanwhile, where I'll spend a great deal of time showering mugs with gratitude for not only urging you to come back to work, but also keeping all that unnecessary information from me. You know, the stuff that got us kidnapped, almost killed, and will ultimately be the reason I'll be boarding an FBI-sponsored flight wearing a goddamn Mickey Mouse shirt. Carla clambered out of bed and tripped into me when one of her flip-flops bent in half beneath her foot, halting her forward motion. She pointed a finger at my face as she used the other hand to grab my arm for support while kicking off the offending footwear. Do not blame Muggs for any of this, you hear me? He was only trying to help. I understand that, Carla. I grabbed her under the armpits and hoisted her back onto the bed. She landed in the center with a thump. But sometimes, helpfulness can lead to fucked upness, to use one of your pet phrases. And what if someone finds out he's holding it for you, huh? This duffel bag full of embezzled cash. What happens then? Did you two think about that? Carla stood up on the bed, towering over my six-foot-four frame with her newly acquired height. Yes, we thought of that, Morneau. We're not complete idiots. I turned my back on her and started to leave the room. Mainly because I thought there was a good chance that if any more words came out of her mouth, I'd do something regrettable, like shove my blue Mickey Mouse t-shirt into her mouth. But turning your back on Carla is never a wise choice. She was on me with her arms around my neck and legs wrapped around my waist before I'd taken two steps toward the door. Jesus, woman, get off! The scuffle that ensued was a sad little rodeo with me bucking and Carla clinging to me like a barnacle on a mission. If I can't sleep, you can't leave. You're just pissed that I told someone else something that I didn't tell you. But if you would settle down for one goddamn minute... Hey, ow! I was trying to pry her arms from around my neck and must have grabbed her too hard, which pissed me off further, because now that bruise would be added to the elbow jab I'd landed on her face the night we got kidnapped, and Carla's recent injury list, doubling on my account, didn't sit so well. Fine, get off. I put my hands over my head so she knew I was waving the proverbial white flag. She slid off my back and I grabbed the towel around my waist to keep it from sliding with her as I turned around. When I reached for her arm to see what damage I'd done, she yanked it away. 
I'm fine. Just sit down and listen to me for once, will you? As if my job these days is doing anything other than listening to you, Carla. She pushed me down into a sitting position on the end of the bed and climbed into my lap. Her legs astride my hips, making herself comfortable, which made me extremely uncomfortable. What are you doing? Ensuring that I've got your full attention. Carla put a hand on either side of my face. I didn't tell you about the money because I knew the legal ramifications. I didn't want to get you in trouble if something went wrong, okay? But the question, Carla, is why you were happy to play so fast and loose with Mug's reputation. What happens if someone gets wind he's got all that money? She removed her hands from my face and leaned in closer, whispering, I made Muggs an offer he couldn't refuse. Did this offer involve a severed cow's head in his bed? I was having trouble concentrating because she'd wound her arms around my neck and was pressing against me. A tactic I was certain was deliberate. No. I paid off his bar note. He owns it free and clear, and that was a risk that he was willing to take. But as soon as we get back, I'll get the money from him and we'll decide what to do with it, all right? So many things about her last statement troubled me, not the least of which was that she'd plunked down a wad of cash that would come back to bite her in the ass if the FBI caught wind of her recent purchase. Unfortunately, what was beneath her ridiculous t-shirt suddenly became a more pressing issue than the possibility of us doing time for fraud, or aiding and abetting, or any number of things I wasn't even sure applied because I was having trouble thinking clearly. Don't worry, I've got a plan. I slid my hands down her back, tucked them under her ass, and squeezed. Well then, if you've got a plan, everything's hunky-dory. I feel much better. I followed said squeezing with an eyebrow waggle that I assume made me look like a randy teenager hoping for a grope in the back seat of his dad's Buick. Carla brushed my lips with a chaste kiss and climbed off me. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. I'm going to sleep. She tumbled back into her bed and pulled the covers over her head. I was still standing in the middle of the hotel room wondering where it all went wrong when two fingers emerged and pulled the covers down so that one of her eyes peeked out. You're not going out, are you? I won't be able to sleep if I have to wonder where you've wandered off to and how long I should wait before assembling a search party. Get some sleep, Carla. I'm not going anywhere. 